Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dev Method. All right, so this is video three of Rust, and today we're going to be talking about variables, data types, and functions. So the core of Rust programming language has a lot of shared fundamentals as other programming languages. So you'll see that in this, what we're doing today. I found some of this stuff uh, actually very similar to Swift and sometimes a little bit confusing if you're coming from JavaScript. So I'll point those things out as they come up. So let's point out the first thing, which is uh, variables and immutability. So um, in Rust, things are immutable by default, meaning you cannot change their value after they're declared. There are exceptions to that, which you will have to write in Rust. You have to write that exception into your code. So first, let's create a new cargo project called variables. Okay, I put some code in here for us to get us started. Just want to point out something here. Um, we have let, and that is telling us to make our variable name x, and we're going to put the value 5 into it. So that's called binding. So we're going to bind 5 into x, and then we're going to print it out. Now this next line here is x now equals 6, and then print that out. Watch what happens. Cargo build. So cannot assign twice to an immutable variable, right? So if we wanted to actually do this, what we would do is do mute, like so. Build. Everything's fine. So that's how you reassign the value of x into something different. That's the idea. So something to keep in mind is that you have to add the mute if that's what you actually want to do. So you have to put your intention of mutability into the variable declaration. Now in JavaScript, there is no concept of mute. There's, there's a let, which is not it's more based on scope than it is about like redeclaring the variable, but you can reassign in JavaScript. And let in Swift is actually kind of like a constant in JavaScript. So I don't want to confuse you guys, but um, so I'll help you guys out if you have questions about that. Just leave it in the comments below. But just know right now that let means it's not going to change, and let mute means it could change if you wanted to. The next thing here I want to show is a constant. So constants are actually really good if you know the value is not going to change. Um, so notice this is uh, three hours in seconds. So this calculates how many seconds are in three hours. And then it stores that. And that's actually really good if you know the variable is never going to change while the application is running or your program is running. Special thing about const here is that there's no mute for constants. Um, they, they cannot be modified. The convention in Rust is that these will be all capital letters and separated by underscores. Back to uh, line 14 here. If we did want this to actually run um, and work right out of the box without doing mute, you could actually do let x. And this actually works. So cargo build. There it is. That works. And that's going to run too. Cargo run. There you have it. So now one thing about um, these variables here that um, cannot change, even if it's a mute, for example, this, is that we can't actually change the type. Like we can't say that this is now a string of spaces. This will actually not work. So cargo build. See, expected integer, but found a string. Yeah, so that's, that's not going to work. All right, so moving on to data types. Every value in Rust is a data type. So Rust is a statically typed language, which means it needs to know about all the types at compile time. So with this example here, uh, notice that uh, it says consider giving guess a type because it actually doesn't know what its type is here that you're trying to get, like what kind of number. So we'll, we'll get into numbers in a little bit or the different types of integers. But this, uh, down below in line 15, this will actually work. All right, so there's uh, scalar types. There are integers, there are floating point numbers, there are booleans and characters. Here's a small table of what they look like. So 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit. 128 bit. And then there's this last one, which is pretty special, the arc, uh, which is I size or U size. So there's signed integers, which are like positive and negative. And then there's unsigned, which is only positive. And the arc ones are actually determined by your operating system. So those sizes will actually be different between operating systems. So integers in Rust will actually default to I32. 
Here's also a little example of the number literals that you could use. So like if you want to do a decimal, so 98.222, um, there's a hexadecimal, octal, I thought this was cool, binary, and then an eight byte only character. So it's B of, a, of like A, pretty sweet. So let's move right on. There's also the floating point number. So just to give you a heads up here, this uh, F64, that is your default floating point number. So that's why we don't have any um, type here. It's just automatically inferred as being F64. But if you want it to be an F32, then there you go. There's your F32. Put it in the type. And then the floating point injures, if you're interested in this, which maybe some of you are, it's the uh, IEEE 754 standard. Yeah. So now we have numeric types and uh, operations. So we have a sum here where you can see there's a plus, there's a minus, there's a multiplication, here's division. Um, and then notice this integer, uh, you might be familiar with other languages here, but this results in zero. Um, and then you have the uh, remainder. So Boolean types will be really quick. Uh, there's a Boolean there, there's type inference for T and it's true. Uh, but if you want it with the type, you just do bool, and then it's false. All right, so now here's um, a char type or a car type, or a, you just call it a character. For, and uh, here's an example of, of a couple written. They're written with single quotes. Um, so there's a Z, here's a, some fancy Z, and then here's an emoji. Now, um, the char or the character is four bytes in Rust. So this could be for, like, accents or individual letters. It's... A little difficult to figure out, um, you know, when you're when you're trying to see how many characters are, say, like in a string or in, in multiple characters in a row. Um, but um, chapter eight of the Rust programming language actually covers that a little bit more in depth, so you can learn about why that's a little bit more difficult in Rust. All right, so that covers it for scalar values. So now we're moving on to compound types. Compound types can group together multiple values into one type. So the two primitives that you get with Rust are actually tuples or tuples, however you want to say it, and arrays. So here, this example, um, the tuple actually has different element types, but the size is fixed, needs to be known. Um, and then you can see here the first part of the tuple is a 32-bit integer. Then we got the F64, the double precision floating point number, um, and then an unsigned 8-bit integer. If you want to access the elements of this tuple, 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 um, then it's uh, just a dot and then like the index into it. So like zero would be the first element, one would be the second, two would be the third, and so on. And uh, since it's you know known what the size is at compile time, then that shouldn't be an issue. Um, if you try and do something higher, it's not going to work. So there's actually a special tuple, 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 tuple. Um, and it's just open and close parentheses, so it's like an empty tuple, and um, that's that's like a unit type. It's a special type. So expressions actually return a unit value when um, there is no other value to return. All right, so that's it for the tuples. Let's talk about arrays. So here's an array. Array is, again, our fixed size, and um, all the elements have to be the same. So in this case, these are all i32, and that's how you can declare an array of i32 integers. Arrays actually allocate their memory on the stack rather than the heap. We go into more detail about that later in the different chapter of uh, Rust Programming Language book. So there's another type here that we're not quite ready for yet, but I just need to let you know that it's there. It's a vector, and that actually can change its size, um, but it actually stores its memory on the heap, so it's slightly different. And the vector also is a part of the standard library. So here's another example of you know, why you might want to use an array that has an affixed size, because the months, there's never less months or more months than these. So here it is. It's all in an array. So here's another way to uh, type annotate your array. Um, it's actually the type, and then there's the semicolon, and then the length or like the size of this array. So here's an interesting one. If you want to make an array um, with five elements of the integer three, you could write it like this. And it essentially translates into something like this. So you don't have to write three, five times in a row. Now, if you want to access uh, different parts of the array or the different elements of the array, that's where you could use integers to index into. 
Um, so this will actually access the first element. This would be the second element you have here. Um, if you try to do like 100, that's actually not even going to compile because it knows that this fixed size array that was declared here will never be more than five. So this actually doesn't compile. So let's look at another example real quick. Let me just walk you through the code. You should be familiar a little bit with this from the guessing game. Um, but here's our array. Now we're going to get an index by string, and it's a string because we're getting it from standard input. We're going to read that line. Um, and then what we're doing is we're actually going to parse it. In the guessing game, we parsed it as a U32. But here we're actually going to parse it as a U size. And if you remember from a little bit earlier, um, that is actually something that is an integer type. So U size, we get here, and if we don't actually get a U size or if we get something that's not a number, um, we'll have a runtime panic or exception happen here. But then this line on 17, very important, because this is variable, we don't know what it is at compile time, it actually will allow us to compile this, but if we do access outside the bounds of the array, it'll be a runtime error. Okay, time to look at functions. These are all over the place in Rust and you're gonna write a bunch too, so we gotta learn about them. So in Rust, we follow the convention of snake case. Um, so here, in my example, I have another function, and uh, its name, as if it's two words like this, like another function, you would separate that with an underscore. So to break this down real quick, fn, that means it's a function, it's a reserved word, it's a key word here, and then followed by a space, and then the name of the function, now, this function has no arguments. It's very similar to the main function, um, at least the one that's written here and the one we've looked at before in the guessing game. So uh, no arguments, and there's actually no return value. So we'll go over return values in a moment. Um, and this function is actually declared after it's used in main. So the compiler doesn't matter um, if it was above or if it was below. The compiler will like both of these things. It's totally fine. So let's look at something else here, um, a return value. It's got the dash and then like the greater than, little arrow here written. Um, we're saying it's gonna be an i32, so it's, an, it's returning the five. Um, notice another function here doesn't return a value, not just because it's not annotated, but because the last expression or like the last statement um, has a semicolon. So if we did a semicolon here, this actually wouldn't run anything, or this wouldn't compile because we don't return anything in this function. So that is like returning. So in JavaScript, it might be like this, right? But uh, in Swift, you can do something like this too. So yeah, that's a little thing to know about. Now with arguments, arguments are also part of the signature as well. So here there's a special variable for the parameter, and uh, it is called x, and you have to give it a type. And so it's colon, space, and then the type. Um, now here we happen to have a return type as well. So now this is an expression, not just some value. So this would be whatever x is plus one. And that's why we called this function plus one. So something interesting here, um, I wanna show you why is actually set to like this block of code. And this block of code actually returns an expression here, which when evaluated will be bound into y. And then we print that value. So what this is doing is saying take three, three plus one is four, so this will be four when the program runs, and then it'll print it out here. So that's how that works. It's kind of interesting, right? All right, everyone, thanks for watching. If you guys have questions about some of these things, just leave them in the comments below. I'd be happy to help. We're gonna do even more stuff with functions and all these different types. Uh, we'll look at more complicated types in the future too. So uh, if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them, and I'll see you again uh, in the next video.